In the last two episodes of this series, we talked about type 2 diabetes, which is the end stage of a spectrum of metabolic disease, characterized by a loss of insulin sensitivity and ultimately a loss in insulin production. In part two, we talked about medications used in prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. These range from medications to improve insulin sensitivity, to those that improve insulin production, to those that work on other aspects of glucose absorption and metabolism. The pharmacologic paradigm culminates in the administration of insulin itself when the beta cells collapse and insulin production craters. By the time things get to this point, the disease may have become irreversible, although that's not at all a given, and insulin becomes essentially life-saving. But things are complicated. In part one, when we covered the pathophysiology, we focused on how insulin resistance develops and how insulin production is ultimately lost. But that's only half the story and half the problem. Before insulin production drops out from under you, the beta cells are trying to cover the resistance of tissues to insulin signaling by making tons of insulin. And so part of the problem in metabolic syndrome, prediabetes and early diabetes, isn't that there's not enough insulin. It's actually too much insulin, or what some have called insulin toxicity. And insulin toxicity is powerfully impacted by lifestyle, including exercise and particularly diet. And diet is a problem for a lot of reasons, most of them having to do with the irrational, emotive, sweaty, seamy realities of the human condition. For one thing, the nutrition data is bad in general, and the data on nutrition for diabetes is no exception. There are a lot of reasons for this, including publication bias, the corruption of research by industry, disagreement on appropriate clinical endpoints, heavy reliance on self-reported nutritional intake, and personal and scientific bias. And these biases don't just show up in the literature either. Since we started our series, I've been inundated with comments and emails. Are you going to talk about intermittent fasting, low carb, keto, paleo, Mediterranean, DASH, vegan, plant-based, gluten-free, raw foods. Which of these diets, I'm asked, do I believe in? People are passionate about this stuff. And that is a big, big problem. Because what's needed is a dispassionate view based on facts and solid research. So my answer is going to satisfy exactly nobody. I don't believe in any of them. I'm a nihilist. That's right. I believe in nothing. And tomorrow I come back and I cut out your cabos! <laughs> Hi, I'm Jonathan Sullivan, and welcome back to Gray Steel. <laughs> the good news about exercise and metabolic disease is that the literature is pretty clear. Exercise is great for prediabetes and diabetes. A lot of the data is flawed, consisting of what I call low-dose exercise medicine, but in aggregate, it shows us that any sort of vigorous exercise improves glucose uptake and cardiovascular health. Some unwise souls try to say that one form of exercise is better than another for diabetes, but there's no solid dispositive evidence for that. And besides, it assumes an either-or distinction where none really exists. Quite the opposite. When you train for both strength and metabolic conditioning, you're giving diabetes a one-two punch, as indicated by data showing that resistance training and metabolic conditioning combined have a synergistic effect. The power of exercise has a lot to do with the immediate improvement in muscle glucose uptake independent of insulin action, reduction in liver and pancreatic fat, and the increased sensitivity of muscle and probably fat and liver to insulin signaling. The mechanisms have not been definitively established at all, but there's reason to believe it works something like this. During intense exercise, glucose transport across the muscle cell membrane is independent of insulin signaling. You don't need insulin to transport glucose into muscle during exercise. This doesn't just promote glucose disposal, but over time, it also increases the availability of glucose transporters an important component of insulin signaling and sensitivity. This adaptation to exercise means that muscle will be more insulin sensitive during rest as well. Additionally, 
muscle will take up glucose more avidly for restoration of muscle glycogen, and it will oxidize glucose more efficiently because exercise will induce the enzymes used in exercise-stimulated carbohydrate metabolism. Finally, exercise doesn't just operate independently of insulin signaling. It churns off insulin signaling, which allows your muscle, fat, and liver tissue to spend some quality time in a non-insulin toxic hormonal signaling environment stimulated by signals that promote fat burning and telling your body that it's okay to start listening for insulin signals again, thereby decreasing the downregulation of insulin receptors. In turn, more insulin sensitivity results in less insulin production, moderation of insulin toxicity, and less stress on those overworked beta cells, so you don't drive them toward utter exhaustion and failure of insulin production. So, on balance, the literature indicates exercise for prediabetes and diabetes, flawed as that data may be. But on the diet side, what a mess. Now, I don't want anybody to misunderstand. All the diets I mentioned earlier have shown some benefit in metabolic disease. For example, consider the Mediterranean diet, the world's greatest culinary misnomer. Whatever they taught you about Italian or Greek cooking in culinary school, this diet, as medically understood, is high in fruits, vegetables, legumes, and unrefined grains with moderate consumption of fish, wine, and dairy, and low but not prohibited consumption of meat. Recent large meta-analyses and systematic reviews suggest that strict adherence to this diet confers some decreased risk of developing diabetes and improves markers for cardiovascular risk in patients with diabetes. You've probably heard of the paleo or paleolithic diet the caveman diet, which eliminates processed foods and sugars, dairy, cultivated grains and cereals, and emphasizes consumption of grass-fed meat, wild fish, and fruits and vegetables. Now, setting aside the considerable evidence that our Stone Age ancestors had widely divergent diets and that they actually ate a fair amount of dairy and cereals, we've known since at least the 1980s that a so-called paleo diet may have a beneficial effect on type 2 diabetes. Although, if you look for well-designed, well-controlled, longitudinal studies on this issue, you're liable to come up relatively empty-handed. Plant-based and vegan diets show promise of benefit in metabolic disease, as do ultra-low-carb and ketogenic diets, which have a lot of overlap with each other, and the paleo diet. As with other diets, the data is mixed, and in aggregate, it's not of the best quality. Check out these videos from Healthcare Triage on the epic sadness of nutritional studies if you want to laugh till you cry. There are more of these diets, too many to cover in a single episode. We'll cover many of them in detail in future videos, but by now it should be clear to you that I have no intention in this video of giving you a complete rundown of any one of these diets, and I'm damn sure not going to prescribe one for you over the interwebs. Others may roll that way, but I think that's grossly irresponsible. So. We have a diverse range of options, some of them espoused by adherence with an almost religious ferocity. It's hard to see a unifying thread between them, although I think I can name a half dozen or so. Bear with me. Metabolic disease, including type 2 diabetes, is a fairly recent epidemic, and in the view of at least one investigator, it has the epidemiological signature of an exposure, as to a toxin. That someone is Dr. Robert Lustig, a pediatric endocrinologist and researcher late of the faculty of UCSF. The Reader's Digest version of Lustig's narrative goes like this. In the late 60s, American politics, science, and industry hopped into bed for a sordid three-way and conceived the unholy spawn that would become our de facto national food policy. Americans were persuaded to switch to a low-fat diet that minimized meats, dairy, and all things fat. Fat was the enemy. Fat was the reason for cardiovascular disease. The research upon which this medical, political, and commercial consensus was erected has subsequently fallen into dispute, or even disrepute. But once the ball got rolling, it was hard to stop. Americans bought into the low-fat orthodoxy and promptly replaced calories from fat with calories from carbohydrate. The carbohydrate intake of industrialized nations jumped up while meat, egg, and dairy intake fell. We did as we were told, and the food industry was all too happy to oblige. 
processed food was already on the upswing, and now Americans were increasingly offered low-fat, low-fiber processed foods. At the same time, the use of high-fructose corn syrup took off, and more and more sucrose and high-fructose corn syrup were incorporated into more and more products. The results of this grand social experiment have not been ideal. We now have far more metabolic disease, obesity, and diabetes than ever before. Lustig and others make a convincing political, historical, economic case for a temporal association between the spike in carbohydrate intake and the epidemic of metabolic disease. Lustig also makes a fairly solid, if still contentious, pathophysiological case, too. You see, fructose, a five-membered ring sugar present in both sucrose and high-fructose corn syrup, is handled differently by the liver than six-membered ring glucose. The liver processes fructose in a manner similar to ethanol, or alcohol, and, according to Lustig, the metabolism of fructose leads to market production and accumulation of fat in a way that glucose metabolism does not. In processed foods, sucrose and fructose are ingested in high concentrations without the accompanying fiber found in plants and vegetables, which also contain some fructose, and are therefore absorbed as a rapid bolus via the portal circulation, directly into the liver where they overwhelm the vestigial biochemical processes that could break them down. The result is a gradual increase in hepatic steatosis, or liver fat, insulin resistance, visceral and somatic fat deposition, metabolic syndrome, and ultimately diabetes. Boom! A diabetes epidemic from exposure to metabolic toxins. A calorie is not a calorie. Now, that's a pretty good story, and I think it may even be at least partly true. I've read and listened to a lot of Lustig's material in the course of my research over the last several months. He does have his detractors, particularly in the food industry, and I don't buy his entire narrative uncritically. There are findings in the literature that challenge his model. And while I have tremendous respect for him as a physician and as a researcher, his stridents can rub some people the wrong way. And you can have documentaries that have been produced recently where a physician wearing a lab coat will stare into the camera and say, sugar does not cause diabetes. Yes, Dr. Neil Barnard, Okay, um, uh, I, I want to have a duel with you, <laughs> okay? I am calling you out, okay? I will meet you anywhere you say. We will leave our guns at home. We will be armed only with the science, and I am going to take you down. <laughs> okay, Understood. I think he has poisoned America. And, and yeah, sometimes he comes off a little Chatner. Then again... He's watched the slow motion catastrophe of metabolic disease for decades, including its effect on his own patients, who are children. So, a bit of passion might be excused. Lustig has clearly thought deeply about this problem, assimilated a vast amount of data, generated some of his own, and has a great deal of clinical experience with diabetes as well. In his view, we have a smoking gun, one that he argues, meets both the scientific and legal definitions for causality. I think he has successfully shifted at least some of the burden of proof to his detractors. In any case, his view gives us a useful starting point for our discussion. Lustig suggests an alternative name for metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes. Processed food disease. I like it. It's the pathophysiologic state that arises when we eat foods that are low in fiber, high in added sugars, calorically dense, and metabolically toxic over time. Diet is a huge part of the problem. So diet is going to be a huge part of the solution. Which brings us back to the diets we talked about earlier. The most extreme of these diets entail a radical intervention like fasting, ultra-low calorie or ultra-low carbohydrate intake, the elimination of entire classes of foods or macronutrients, and so on. All of them have been shown in at least some cases to result in market improvement or even remission of diabetes, although none have been shown to do so in populations or more reliably than any of the others. Nevertheless, these radical approaches have the same tendency as any other radical idea, to foster radical devotion and black and white positions, particularly as regards the demonization of competing dietary approaches or foods that are thought to be evil. 
you'll hear it told that there are no minimum requirements for carbohydrate because the body can make its own. We don't actually need to ingest any carbs at all, as the Inuit supposedly demonstrate with their zero-carb caribou and blubber eating way of life. Well, gluconeogenesis is indeed a wonderful thing, but this biochemical fun fact represents the reality of neither modern life nor the history of human civilization. Human beings have been stuffing themselves with cereals. Barley, rice, sorghum, spelt, triticale, millet, yams, taro, for thousands of years. And meat. And eggs. And dairy. Check this guy out. That's my Grandpa Sullivan. The pony is not an affectation. That was his horse. He was an honest-to-God cowboy. He worked on a cattle ranch and did highway construction. He was vital, active, strong, healthy, opinionated, stubborn, and a total pain in the ass. He had his first heart attack in his 70s while putting a new housing on the well out back. He finished what he was doing and then went to the hospital. The fates couldn't kill him with time. They had to assassinate him in an auto accident in his 80s. You may be shocked to learn that my grandpa was not a vegan. He didn't do keto. I'm not sure he could have picked out the Mediterranean on a map. He didn't know what a macronutrient was, and he would have lost patience with an attempt to explain it to him. He did not go in for intermittent fasting. But he also didn't eat Twinkies or Hot Pockets or drink Big Gulps or sit on his ass all day. He ate potatoes and rice and buttered bread, along with bacon and eggs and chicken and beef and venison that he went out and killed for himself. And he loved my grandma's elderberry jam. He was, in short, a meat and potatoes man. And like the rest of his meat and potatoes, non-fasting, non-vegan, non-paleo, non-gluten sensitive, non-lactose intolerant, non-Facebook, unwired generation, he was not a part of our current epidemic of obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, identity nutrition, and food theology. The explosion in diabetes and obesity is barely 40 years old. So something about the all-carbs-are-evil position seems to not quite fit, doesn't it? Or the all-meat-is-evil position. Or the all-dairy-is-evil theology. Oh, and by the way, it's not true that even the Inuit consume zero carbs. I have one word for you. Glycogen. Think about it. So, I really don't get it when people start talking about demonizing, radically reducing, or even eliminating an entire macronutrient. We tried that before, with fat, remember? And it didn't work out so well. So now, unlike in my grandpa's day, we have an epidemic of obesity, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes. Most of us don't have a horse, and if we do, it's already out of the barn, metabolically speaking. We have to start where we are. So, let's reconsider these dietary strategies for reducing or reversing metabolic disease. Fasting, Mediterranean, keto, low-carb, vegan, and so on. From where I sit, they actually do have several things in common as dietary approaches to the prevention or treatment of metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes. One, they have all been shown to confer some real and important benefits, sometimes in some cases. Two, None have been conclusively shown in large RCTs to be clearly superior to the others in populations. Three, all of them result in weight loss, which is generally agreed to be critical for the treatment of metabolic disease. Four, all of them reduce carbohydrate intake to some degree, ranging from moderate in the Mediterranean to extreme in keto which means that all of them moderate the insulin toxicity characteristic of metabolic syndrome and the pre-diabetic state. Five, all of them, therefore, by their very nature, severely restrict or eliminate the consumption of processed foods and added sugars, which means that all of them, by their very nature, promote a diet rich in whole, real, high-fiber, natural foods, wholesomely prepared. Six, Finally, and perhaps most important, all of these diets require an aggressive engagement of the patient with their nutritional life, 
taking back ownership and control of their nutrition from the food industry, actively selecting, preparing, and tracking their intake. So again, which of these approaches do I believe in? I'm intrigued and excited by all of them, but I don't believe in any of them. And so now some of you are really pissed off because this is exactly like saying to a 16th century Catholic or Protestant that both religions are fine because they both worship the same God. Next thing you know, you're hugging a big pole and they're stacking kindling at your feet. Screw that. This is nutrition and health we're talking about, not a system of worship. If a total stranger told you in a YouTube video that you should start taking a sulfonylurea or a thiazolidine dione or such and such a dose of insulin, would you believe him? Well, I sure as hell hope not. So why are people so ready to believe that this diet and not that will work for them and for everybody else? That's crazy. There's no way I or anybody else can tell which of these particular nutritional approaches is best for you without a detailed analysis of your metabolic health, current eating patterns, exercise regimen, and so on. There is no one-size-fits-all nutritional strategy. The best data available seems to indicate that it is not this or that macronutrient or this or that exercise or medication that does the trick. It's the entire way of life. Think about it. How often does somebody go full-blown paleo or intermittent fasting or vegetarian, but keep smoking and drinking and being sedentary? That's so silly, even most humans won't do it. When people commit to something like Atkins or fasting or ultra-low carb, it's because they've made a choice to change their lives. Thus, it's a common observation in the literature that vegans are universally observed to do better at multiple health outcomes. But that it's also almost impossible to disentangle the vegan diet itself from the entire lifestyle, which incorporates a number of very healthy extra dietary parameters. Vegans tend to be very health conscious. They're way into yoga and meditation, and they're totally not into cigarettes, alcohol, sleep deprivation, Twinkies, or black tar heroin. But like most people, they are definitely into being right and wanting everyone else to know it. But the more I look at what we know about lifestyle and diabetes, the more I'm convinced that if I could do a real randomized trial comparing people who went controlled energy intake vegan with aerobics and yoga and good sleep and no smoking to people who went controlled energy intake moderate carb Mediterranean with HIT and Tai Chi and good sleep and no smoking to modern cavemen who went controlled energy intake paleo with strength training and conditioning and good sleep and no smoking, ensuring that all the groups minimize processed foods and sugars, they do pretty much the same at preventing or controlling metabolic syndrome and diabetes. Alas, no such study will ever be done, or at least I'm not holding my breath. Which means that for the time being, we are stuck with a high heat, low light, faith-based debate on what is the diet and exercise regimen for diabetes. So people will continue to hold passionate, almost religious opinions about diet and exercise, even though the only thing we can be sure of based on the data available is that there is not and can never be a one-size-fits-all solution. So what to do if you have metabolic syndrome, prediabetes or diabetes? You can begin with three simple critical steps. They are just the beginning, but they will get you on your way. Step one is to begin a vigorous exercise program. We have a book that can help you with that. Step two, start tracking your nutritional intake. Get a baseline for your diet in hard numbers. Once you start logging your food, you're more likely than not to be stunned by your caloric intake, the amount of added sugar, and the lack of fiber in your diet. If you're not tracking, you just don't know. And step three, talk to your doctor and medical nutritionist and insist that they play nice together and with your coach because your exercise prescription will have to work with your nutritional prescription and vice versa. Ask questions about all of these nutritional approaches and which one your team thinks will work best for you. And ask yourself which one you think you can and actually will do over the long haul because that's a big part of the equation. There is no end to this journey. 
But there is an ongoing destination, a healthy lifestyle full of whole, natural foods, vigorous exercise, good sleep, stress reduction, and weight and body composition control, following parameters that work for you and that you can maintain for the long haul because they fit you and your life. Because even if there were a one true diet or a one true exercise program, which there isn't, what good would it do you if you wouldn't or couldn't do it? I miss you, Grandpa. Give Grandma a hug for me. Thanks for watching this episode of Gray Steel. I hope you've enjoyed our series on diabetes and we'll have more to say about nutrition, including the dietary approaches mentioned today in future episodes. Remember, our content is for infotainment and educational purposes only and does not constitute medical advice for any particular person, patient, disease, or condition. If you have questions about your health, you need to work closely with your physician. I'd like to thank Robert Santana and Kurt Van Skoik for their helpful input on today's episode. Thanks to our patrons on Patreon who make this channel possible. A big welcome to our newest patrons, Jerry Millay, Carol Trojanowski, Dr. Julian Donovan, Derek Croft, John and Marie Kerrig, Will Wyatt, Debbie Rotslavsky, and John Tyler. A special shout out to our newest Olympic patrons, Dr. Fred Barnes and Dr. Kurt Van Skoik. If you'd like to join them in your support for the Graysteel channel, just go to patreon.com slash graysteel, where any level of support gains you access to our online community, Patrons of Graysteel. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, stay strong and stay healthy.